Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, CSIS. Um, thank you for coming today. It's you know I know it's election day and it's uh, not the nice day outside, but um, this is a very important event on the release of the World Development Report 2019 on the changing nature of work. Um, the World Bank has been uh, doing this report since 1978, so almost you know, more than 40 years. And today we have a really good presentation by the one of the co-directors, Federica Saliola, and then followed by a, a panel of experts. So I'm going to invite Federica to the podium. She's going to give a 20-minute presentation, and then uh, we're going to have a, a really interesting discussion uh, with the distinguished panelists. So Federica, please join us. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm delighted to uh, present the uh, just released, I mean, already um, almost a month ago, but still a pretty fresh report, the 2019 World Development Report on the Changing Natural Work. As Romina mentioned, I'll provide you just with a 20 minute brief overview, but I'm happy to answer questions, if any, later on. So let me begin by um, talking a little bit about the approach and the way uh, we see technology based on the research that we conducted over the past year. Um, so the current, there is a lot of literature on the future of work, many studies, and so they tend to be very negative, right? They, what we hear all the time is that robots are here to take our jobs, it will be uh, jobless growth in a number of countries, but you know, when we look at the uh, technology from a broader perspective, and when we look at the past, when we look at the present, you know, the scenario is not that negative. And with this report, we would like to present more positive views about technologies that, you know, technology is, is bringing opportunities, has done that so far over the past 100 years but also uh, you know, brings challenges. So without disregarding the challenges, we need to think also what, that, what advantages and what opportunities are coming. And I'm saying that because, so what this graph shows you, um, it is this box, right? Which is, if you think of any uh, general economy, it tells you, you know, what is the current employment, let's say, you know, in sector, whatever, a traditional sector, imagine manufacturing, for example. Right, so what happens where you know, automation comes in the picture is that normally this box shrinks because this is the number of workers that are employed in country X in sector X. So what we tend to focus too often is only on the number of workers, you know, how, you know, what we lose. You know, lost employment in old sector. You know, this job, this, these workers that are replaced by robot. But we forget to look at the fact that oftentimes you know, automation is accompanied by innovation. And what happens is that certain jobs or certain tasks disappear, but other jobs and other tasks are created. So there is also a new box that normally come in, into the picture, which, yes, the challenge is to make sure workers are absorbed by the new sector, but, you know, it's not just about what goes down, it's also what goes up. And this is country specific, you know, it depends on how many traditional sector a country has and, and many other factors. I just wanted to start this presentation by, you know, presenting a more positive picture about what technology can bring in addition to what disrupts. Now, the second um, thing that I would like to um, just spend one minute on is that we hear all these negative views and these projections, but when you put all those projections together, you see that the variance, I mean, how much they, they change, it, it's, it's it, you know, quite uh, noticeable. Basically, if you put together all the studies that are out there for the United States, you find that, you know, the number of um, jobs that will be lost ranges from 7% to 47%. To Ukraine, 5 to 4 So what tells us? It's very hard to predict technology. So. In this report, we stay away from big predictions. We look at jobs at the present, and you know we try to draw conclusions, of course, but we stay away from you know future negative uh, projections about uh, job losses. Now, let me address 
one of the first questions that we uh, ask ourselves when we started this, 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 um, the work for this report, which is what is changing? So we see three, uh, a number of changes. Um, one, which is my, not surprising, um, it is the change in the demand for skills. So e technologies tend, the current technology tends to replace um, what we call the routine-based type of tasks. Um, clearly, we, we, we're going to see a higher premium, a higher demand for those skills that are not easy replicable by robots. So then we see a higher premium on what we call the social emotional skills, which is the ability to work in a team, to think critically, high or the cognitive skills. But more importantly, is the that skills of being adaptable. What we see is not just a black or white picture. It's not that you know only social emotional skills plus you know being good in math or what we call STEM is important. It's also adaptable. Oftentimes. You know, we see these jobs like a marketing analyst that has to write algorithm. So that requires, you know, number of skills that don't really come together in a very clear way. So being able to be adaptable, it's, it's very, very important. Although, again, we see a clear tendency toward those skills that are not easy um, replicable by robots. And, and, you know, this is just uh, an, an example of we basically look at jobs uh, and we see what, what they require. And you see that social emotional uh, compared to past, uh, past years are, are more in demand. Now, the second change that we find very revolutionary and we think is oftentimes disregarded by the current literature has to do with what we call the digital platforms. Those platforms that use digital technology uh, change completely the way of doing business. So if in the past the physical presence was a requirement and therefore to have companies in a country you need a specific ecosystem around it, a certain infrastructures, those digital platforms like you know, in, in the plant in the United States, but we find them any, anywhere in the world, but think about Amazon or Uber, change completely the way of doing business because physical presence is not longer a requirement. And more than anything, those, those firms grow extremely fast. It's called a, um, a scale without mass, because unlike traditional companies that needed certain you know, services to be present and, and to be part of the firm, those firms outsource. So the services that they need to grow, they are in the market. So you can really enter the market as a startup with not so much um, financing initially and grow like the next Uber. This is a, an example. We put together the history of IKEA and the history, uh, for example, of the Taobao, which is um, uh, you know, a Chinese um, online, it's the equivalent of Amazon, basically, similar. Um, and you see that what took uh, IKEA it took um, about 70 years to grow a, a business of $42 uh, billion. For the Taobao, in 10 years, they reached about 700. And, they, and the suppliers that they joined their network are millions. So the, you see that the bubbles basically show you how long it took for them to grow and see how much the Taobao grew compared to IKEA, which is still see the little, the little uh, bubble at, at the bottom. So why, why I want to bring this to your attention? Because so if skills, the demand for skills is not surprising, those firms make that relevant for more people than ever before. Because in the past, the change in demand for skills was relevant if you were living in an industrialized area or in a country. Now you can live in a rural area in Senegal and be able to work for you know, Amazon Turk. Right, if you have the right skills. So, so there are no such boundaries that used to exist in the past. And of course, those firms, you know, they're not just, um, you know, they just don't bring positive things. Of course, they bring a lot of new challenges, and I'm happy to speak about it later. They change completely the rule of competitions. They buy out their surprise. They create big conglomerates, big monopolies. They avoid taxes in a purely legal way. Um, you know, because we don't know where the value is produced, right? Those are virtual markets. So we don't know how to tax them, basically. So they enjoy this tax avoidance everywhere in the world. And although we've been discussing how to address it, solutions are still not there. 
And finally, the third change is um, what we call the gig economy, which is a different way of working. In the past, we, we were used to nine to five permanent traditional jobs. Now, you know, it's, it's more fluid. Uh, you know, we have more freelancers, people that do part-time jobs. So those traditional nine to five are disappearing more and more. And that is kind of creating more problems in, especially in our income countries where those, the, the gig economy is more popular, you know, because it's basically a, a new way of being informal, right? Unlike um, in the past where workers were, were formal. But they just want to say that this is still less than 3% of the global workforce. It is coming very fast, it is important, but it's still m minor compared to other uh, type of um, jobs. Now, the question is then what government could do, you know, in the light of those three changes that we see happening in, in labor markets. Um, this report makes a big call for action for government, asking for more investment in, in three building blocks. The first one is investment in human capital. The second one is investment in social protection. And the third one, it's, it's more, you know, the message is don't forget that you need revenues for additional investment. So the third building block has to do with fiscal space. Now, on the first one, um, there are two, I would say, main components in, in for the human capital package. One is the World Bank, uh, sorry, recently um, released, oh my God, sorry. A human Capital Index, which is our chapter three. It was just released uh, in, in Bali on October 10, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and why we're doing this, uh, why we launched this new uh, Human Capital Index. Well, the reason is that uh, when you look at what we call the uh, Human Capital Foundations, which is basic health and basic education, you know, despite the progress, despite the many changes, we still, that many countries are still lacking that. Like, if you look at the difference, for example, in, in uh, uh, I don't know why it does, sorry, in learning, I don't know why it goes, it doesn't say. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to show the differences in learning are really dramatic. So what, what this index does, it looks at the education and it looks at health. Right, so basic health still, you know, we have a huge rates of kids stunting, low adult survival in a number of countries. And when we look at education, what we see is that not only people don't stay in school as much as they should, but even for the one that stay in school, um, okay, oh, it's okay. I don't know why, it's fine. It, even, yeah, technology. <laughs> Uh, even for the kids that stay in school, they don't learn. So the bank developed a new methodology that compares the quality of education, and you see the differences are dramatic. So in many countries, kids go to school and they don't learn anything. So in a labor market that is asking for, you know, skills, uh, social emotional skills, and higher order cognitive skills, how can we even go that far in countries where those you know, foundational um, elements are, are not there. So, so the first component of the human capital package is this human capital <laughs> index. This slide shows the methodology where we look at the survival, we look at the um, education uh, quality, and then uh, we look at the health. I, I didn't, and I won't go into details for that, but um, again, I'm happy to, um, to provide you with more information later. So when we think about foundations, which is again, is something that uh, you know, everybody needs to have. But then when we think about you know, the, the human capital that we need for the change in labor work, then we need to look also beyond what are these, these two important pillars, health and education. So we need to look at what we call a lifelong learning, meaning that we need to um, look at what happens before kids go to school, which is what we call the early childhood development, and we need to look at what happens when people finish school, 
My, so adults learning and tertiary education. So the, the, the early childhood development is very important because earlier I mentioned that it is critical to be adaptable. Well, that's the age between three, three and six when we learn how to be adaptable. It's the age when we learn to learn. And if you look around the world, 260 million kids do not receive proper early childhood development. So if you miss that window, because learning is cumulative, it's very hard to accumulate it later on. But then when we also think about what happens afterwards, how many times we hear, oh, we need to risk, retool or reskill people. But how do we reskill people? It's not an easy task when you, you reskill people because adults' brain uh, learn dif differently compared to teenagers. So we need to think what is not working with adults' learning program and also how we can better address that, that issue. But also tertiary education. Social emotional skills can be taught during tertiary education. And tertiary education can also accompany this lifelong learning process. So, so in, the, in the report, we discuss some ideas around it, but it is a continuum. It's not just a static learning, given the demand, the change in demand for, for, for jobs. Um, the second building block is a social protection. What, w there are many um, reasons that motivated us to have a social protection uh, block, and <clears throat> Mika Rutowski will, will provide uh, probably more <clears throat> details, but we asked the question, what is changing? Another important question is, what is not changing, which undermines people's ability to thrive in, in the current labor markets? Well, when we look at the share of informality, is really striking. If you look at the share of informality today and 30 years ago, it hasn't changed. Th those shares are so stable. Right? We have you know, 80% in Africa, 50% in Latin America. India is 91%. So when we think about what are the challenges, how we can prepare people to you know, address the labor market challenges, well, let's consider that in a country like India, we're only talking about 9%. Right? So, so then we need to think, if we really want to accompany workers to that transition, then we need to think of a way to, to help these informal workers that do not exist anywhere, don't get, they normally in low productivity, informal jobs, no access to technology, no social protection. So those people don't have a, a stable income and they don't have any um, insurance, right? They will never get a pension. So, so that's why this, this report presents a different package in terms of social protection. We start with giving people a, what we call a guarantee social minimum, which is in terms of social assistance and, and social insurance. So basically, um, we try to rethink the social protection in a way which is decoupled by having a formal job. So all in that way, we can reach to everybody. And this is something which is relevant for the low-income countries, where at the moment, only 18% of people get social assistance of the poorest quant quintile, and only 2% get social insurance. But when we think about the gig economy, this is an issue that is coming to high-income countries too. Because if you don't have a traditional you know, nine to five contract, then you don't get social protection anymore. So, so then we try to rethink how we can give, you know, everybody social income and insurance in a way which is subsidized for the poor. And this is, right, so what basically the, the report present, again, I won't go into details on that, but the idea is that if people get protected, not through the wage contribution to having a formal job, but through a social protection system that is dealing from that, then we need to also rethink labor regulations and rebalance them in a way that firms can create jobs. Right? So oftentimes it's very expensive, uh, it's very burdensome to um, readjust the workforce for firms, and if, again, if, if the reason for having certain regulations is not protecting people, then we can help also companies going through that transition. So it is a package that has three components, social minimum, which is assistance, then the social insurance, which is uh, you know, subsidized for the poor and then have different layers based on what kind of job people have, and then the labor market regulation. 
And uh, finally, let me conclude with a third building block, which has to do with, with taxation. Um, uh, this, um, the discussion in the report is not really meant to bring new evidence uh, here. It's more to make sure when we discuss investment and what is needed in labor markets today, we make sure uh, governments also think how they can create the fiscal space. And when we look, we compare the revenues in uh, high income, middle income, and low income countries, you see that, especially in low income countries, this is a big issue because they only collect 10% because they don't have the capacity, because they don't have a base. So if everybody is informal, who pays taxes? And in addition today, we have digital platforms and multinational, they are not paying taxes. Um, we had, uh, when we in the earlier stage of the report, we presented this, uh, this idea to the, um, sorry, <laughs> the World Bank Executive Director for Nigeria. And I thought that for a country like that, that there was not a priority, but he was insisting on making sure we would develop this because he's, he told me, he said, for many years, we had this, all these extractive industry companies not paying taxes in Nigeria. And now he said they see Uber and Amazon coming to Nigeria, not paying taxes. So they really see that as an issue, an, an issue for them, but also like a missed opportunity because if they collect that revenue, then they can use it for different purposes purposes in the country. So if we think taxes is something that would mostly interest high income countries, well, we need to rethink that because the low income countries are the one more, more in need than others, although they are income too. And the report presents a number of ideas on how we can create the revenues um, so, so that you know, we can uh, um, deliver those investments in, in human capital and social protection. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Federica, uh, for that uh, very good presentation. Uh, the report is online. Uh, the World Bank is going green, so we don't have you know copies here, but I, I invite you to read it. Uh, now I'd like to invite our panelists to join me at the table, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll open up a discussion first with some uh, remarks from the panelists. So please, Laura, Kevin, Peter. So um, we have a very good uh, panel today. Uh, to my left is Mikhail Rutkowski. He is the Senior Director for Social Protection and Jobs. He oversees uh, the World Bank's work um, on, on this area. And um, I, I would invite Peter to uh, give some, some initial remarks about the WDR and your work at the World Bank, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks very much for the invitation here. Um, what I'm uh, going to do is to focus on one part of messages of the World Development Report 2019, uh, which are messages the, related to, uh, to social protection. Uh, as you heard in Federica's presentation, uh, we have two, uh, uh, two features of the labor market which require a deeper reflection. The first is that in developed countries, we clearly see, uh, even though it is still at the low level, but fast growing, uh, non-standard employment. Uh, uh, through the gig work, part-time contracts being out and in on the labor for, of the labor force, uh, entering into type of the relationship uh, with uh, the labor market, which is very different than the traditional standard employment contract. It is particularly essential for those countries that build their social protection system based on standard employment contract, and typically we see those economies uh, in Europe, in countries that following the Bismarckian tradition decided to build their social protection system, pensions, disability, others, around payroll tax, which is predicated on uh, essentially taxing uh, payroll of standard employees in long-term lifetime contracts. 
That type of arrangement is becoming increasingly under pressure given the, uh, the reduced role uh, of the standard employment contract. And then at the very same time, what we observe is, and uh, Federica showed the slide, which is enormous persistence of informality in developing and emerging economies. The average number 64.7. India number is particularly telling because India, India was 91% informal 40 years ago and is exactly 91% now. And it all happened during the period when so many organizations and so many of us were trying to push for formalization, basically assuming that this good world of standard employment contracts should be available to everybody. And this is really bad that we have this dichotomy, so let's do something to formalize them. And I think it is high time, and WDR recognized it, is to reflect on that, that this is not the way to go. This turned to be the way to nowhere. Um, uh, and one of the problems in this way of thinking was that even though standard employment contract was never a reality in developing world, it functioned there as a gold standard, as a point of reference, as an aspiration. And I think it is time to reflect on the disservice being done to people in developing countries with that frame of mind. And I think uh, I can say that the World Development Report proposes a different uh, way of thinking, and uh, the, that way of thinking in the context of social protection makes one fundamental observation, which is that what happened is that the recent technological developments and the persistence of informality in developing world essentially blurs the divide between formal and informal work. There is a, some kind of a convergence in the nature of work between advanced and emerging economies. Because of labor markets becoming more fluid in developed countries and informality persisting in, in developing countries. Um, so in this context, what is the crux of the matter? What that means for social protection? So what that means for social protection is the need to invest and build systems that are independent from standard employment contracts and systems that allow for social protection of informal sector workers or gig economy workers. Essentially, it is the philosophy is make a gig work decent work or make informal work protected work. Uh, that calls upon uh, uh, upon, upon several things, but the most important of those are first, in the case of informal sector, expand social safety nets, social assistance. We already have um, uh, cash benefits uh, across the world in more than 100 countries. However, when you look at bottom quintile of the population there, only 17% is covered by any program of social assistance. So they exist, but the coverage is very, very small. And we have growing evidence of the very positive impact of cash transfers, both at the standards of living of workers in the informal sector, but also on their behavior in terms of investing in human development and in in terms of making the money available, putting them into productive use, both for unconditional and conditional cash transfers. Conditional meaning conditioned upon things like sending kids to school or uh, doing health uh, checkups. So this is, this is a, the expansion of that would be warranted and is very much needed. The second direction of thinking, which is very much needed, is to, is to uh, think about the creation of social insurance systems that would be available for informal sector workers. And given technological developments, identity for development, uh, ability to identify individuals, ability to uh, register consumption and financial transactions, there is an increasing number of opportunities by using a combination of auto-enrollment and nudging to think of expanding social insurance schemes to those who are either in the informal sector or in a gig economy, to those who do not have and will never have a standard employment contract. And here the technology as well as ability to do good identification uh, really co co cooperates towards opening up these solutions. And we have pension systems in India, in Africa, arch pension system in Benin, uh, attempts in Kenya and Ghana. It is still, it is small scale, but the potential for growth is enormous. Um, so I think the, 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 that, that, that approach is a fundamental 
conclusion of the well development report with respect to what should happen with social protection both in the developed and developing world of course there are many we could go into details there are many uh, conclusions going for uh, countries that are developed for instance um, it is important to have portable benefits it's important to be able to carry the rights when you move across firms if you are in standard employment contract or carry with you if you drop out of the labor market so there is a strong argument for defined contribution systems as opposed to defined benefit systems and so on and so forth but you you get the logic it is building a system independent from standard employment contracts that protects the workers independent from their employment status and which is not biased against workers by over using payroll tax. Payroll tax is taxing labor. The fact that payroll tax is so heavily used in so many countries to pay for social insurance is not dictated by economic logic. It's a, in, in a certain way an accident of the history because it was the, easy, the wage fund was the easiest taxable tax base. And then the whole ideology was built around it, especially the one built around the solidarity between employer and employees. Whereas the reason for that had nothing to do with solidarity, it had to do with expediency of using that tax base. And it is distortive anti-worker type of tax. So uh, switching the tax base is very important. My final comment, I think is very important, is as follows. When, I, when, I, when I'm telling you about, about this not pro, uh, formalization not progressing, there are two ways one can comment on that. One say, OK, it is not progressing, but let's keep trying, right? And I very clearly said, let's not keep trying. Let's recognize formalization as we think of it, as we have thought of it. It's not going to progress. We need to reframe our mind and think of protecting workers regardless of the employment status, formal or informal. But I wanted to say more. I wanted to say that if we continue pushing formalization, we are actually doing collateral damage to informal sector workers. If you think of African countries that create a pension system for civil servants, then they create different rules based on different rules, pension system for a set of state-owned enterprises. Then a third system, system, a pension system for another set of enterprises. Ethiopia has five pension systems, all covering 8% of the population with different rules. Doing that, one could say, OK, at least we improve the, the, the life of those uh, elite in the context of African country, 8%. But it's not that. By enhancing the duality of the labor market, by investing into supporting those who are already better off, we actually reduce the chances of vast majority in the informal sector to have any protection whatsoever, be it in the form of social assistance or social insurance. So it is not benign to say, OK, it, the countries that are 90% informal, a long time ago, 90% now, OK, let's keep trying. Maybe we'll be lucky, because while trying, there is a damage by, by, by missed opportunities done to the majority of workers in the countries which large informal sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mikhail, for, that, for those comments on social protection. We have three other organizations here that have been working on a future of work, and um, you might have different views or you might have similar views, and I would like to hear from you. We have Laura Ripani. She's a lead specialist in the labor markets and social security division of the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, welcome, Laura. You've been heading the uh, future of work agenda for the bank. Uh, we also have Kevin Cassidy. Uh, Kevin is the uh, director of the International Labor Organization office here in, in Washington, DC. He has 33 years of experience in international development. We would like to hear your, your, um, your thoughts about uh, the WDR and, and Mikhail's um, comments. And then finally, Peter Joyce. Peter, is a senior researcher and general ma manager of RTI's Global Center for Youth Employment, and he has had a past life at Cisco. So I'd like to also hear your thoughts about uh, today's presentation, the three main you know, buckets uh, on skills, corporate changes, and the gig economy. So let me start with you, Laura. Can you, you know, what are your reactions to the, you know, the presentation and Mikhail's uh, remarks? Well, first of all, thank you, CSIS, for the invitation to this panel. Thank you, Romina. Um, and thank you for the, the opportunity to comment on this uh, nice report. Uh, let me start by saying what I like about the report. Uh, first, the topic <laughs> is very close to my heart. <laughs> and it's a very, very important topic uh, for the world, but also for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, where I work. 
Um, even though many institutions, individuals, and researchers have been focusing on the future of work, uh, as uh, Federica was uh, mentioning, uh, trying to predict what's happening, what's going to happen in the future, the report concentrates on a specific part of the discussion, that is the changing nature of work. So from the title, it gives you the idea that it's not a book about futurology, but actually how work is changing in terms of not only the individuals, but also the firms. So I really like that specific, the nature of the report that is focusing on that, on that section. It, it, if you read the book that I had the opportunity to read, not only now in October 11th, but with previous versions and online versions of the report, that was a nice feature as well of uh, releasing uh, every week. Um, you can see that you can um, see the changing nature of work in firms and individuals with the nice illustrations and stories of all of the, the all of the, over the world. Uh, it give you, gives you examples of uh, the, the, how individuals are changing, as Federica was mentioning, how they work differently. They don't have this attachment to the employer as they did in the past, but also how firms are changing. The platform-based economy is changing the nature of firms, and this is going to have a huge impact in the way we work uh, in the future. Um, and second, I like that the report, uh, many, much of the research has been done for developed countries. So uh, if you see the, the papers that are about the future of work, you see that many of them are for the US or for Europe. But the, the, the report talks about uh, developing economies and developed economies and compares the situation for different countries around the world. So that's the contribution that I think is very important. Um, and third, I like that also uh, it's not only a book about diagnostics, but also a book about policies. So it talks about what the, they, they post uh, this in three sets of solutions, uh, lifelong learning, um, the um, enha enhancing social protection and revenue mo mobilization. And, and for that, uh, I think it's, it's important because uh, when we, uh, you approach a country and you say, well, there is uh, all of these changes that you are, are seeing, they also like to hear about what are the avenues of, for solutions. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, uh, many countries are interested in this topic, but they uh, ask us for what we can do about it, especially government. So I like that about the book, the combination of diagnostics and policies. Uh, what we share in terms of the position of the IDB, for sure we share the optimism about the future. We've seen past uh, in industrial revolutions or revolutions that uh, had to do with technology, and we've seen what Federica was mentioning, that it's not only destruction of jobs, but creation of new jobs. So uh, the only thing that we are optimistic with, with a word of caution in terms of for developing economies, uh, we see an optimistic future if action is taken. So we can actually shape the future of work. It's not something like a natural disaster that is going to come over us. But if we take the right actions and decisions and now, not tomorrow but now, we are, can make the most out of the fourth industrial revolution. In terms of policies, I would say that um, there are many similarities. One thing that we stress that is not uh, as stressed in the report is the need for supporting or managing the transitions of workers between jobs. We know that people are going to have to change much more like, quickly between jobs and all of the intermediation services, job platforms, mentoring, coaching, uh, you name it. it, there are so many resources that uh, workers will have to have to move between jobs and between tasks and different gigs that they are going to do. So that's something that we really put a, uh, an important place for at the IDB. But overall, as I mentioned before, we are very happy. We know that the WDR is always a very influential book. It's an important book for many developing economies. And I think um, having this uh, as a, the main topic of the 2019 WDR is super important. And we look forward to many opportunities to discuss this in Latin America and the Caribbean together with the World Bank. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of marketing for the IDB. We just released a, 
yeah. a website and um, some publications. So what I don't remember the um, link, but it's IDB, probably Future of Work. Or future something of like Work, that. yes. <laughs> um, so thank you, Laura, for that. Thank you. Talking about uh, managing the future of work, uh, we have Kevin Cassidy present here. Uh, the ILO has been managing the future, well, the, the world of work for 100 years. You are releasing um, your commission report in January. So uh, ILO has formed a very significant and high level uh, commission on the future of work and again a little marketing you have you can download all the, uh, re the issue briefs that are you know very uh, carefully um, written and, and thought about so I'd like to uh, hear from you Kevin and how ILO is thinking about um, you know the future of work and your reactions to the WDR well thank you very much and thanks to CSIS for inviting me and to be here on this panel um, the ILO and the World Bank have worked uh, closely together for many, many years. Um, actually, uh, the ILO and the World Bank had launched in 2016 a global partnership on universal social protection. Um, this has been, I think, uh, an interesting uh, partnership. There are lots of divergence in, uh, in approaches uh, on this and even uh, the outcomes of what we're looking for there. Uh, but first, uh, just to, uh, to say for the ILO in terms of the Future of Work report, uh, we are a rights-based institution. Uh, the uh, main objective of the ILO is to provide decent work for all men and women. Uh, that is a rights-based approach that includes the standards and norms in the world of work, uh, looking at how uh, we could, and there was a mention about informality. Uh, we do believe that informal workers are unfortunately uh, outside the protection of law. That needs to be changed. Uh, they are vulnerabilized. They unfortunately cannot earn uh, to their potential. Um, so we do believe that there should be a transition from that informality to formality. Uh, investing in people, which I think is uh, a main, uh, a main uh, theme throughout the, uh, the World Bank report, is very important. Um, uh, we believe that the financing of that investment is a very important and sticky question as well, too. Who is going to pay for the education of workers or the skilling of workers, uh, where businesses will largely benefit from that, um, and delinking that uh, from the employment relationship sometimes can be problematic. Um, the idea also in the forward, I believe it's mentioned about improving labor regulation. Uh, we don't necessarily believe there's a binary choice between deregulation or full regulation. I think we have to have smart regulation and I think we can find a balance of that. And that does require the voice of those uh, actors in the real economy. And that includes the workers, employers and governments themselves. Um, we're happy to see in the World Development Report uh, that they believe also, as the ILO does, that technology will not determine the future. I think the Director General here at CSIS many months ago had said that there's no future of work waiting to receive us. Uh, the future of work are the investments that we make and, of course, uh, the policies that we uh, put in place. So I think in terms of that, uh, we are in control uh, of, of that future. Um, some of the concerns we have, not just with the uh, WDR report, but I think wider sort of discussions is that there's a bit of a short-term view uh, on successes. I think what we need to do is we need to look at, my apologies, on that. Uh, we need to have a longer term view. We need to look at the, uh, the um, stakeholders uh, in this process as well too. It is not just up to the, uh, the businesses to decide or those with the financial purse strings, uh, but the individuals who are affected by uh, the employment contracts and by the policies that are put in place. Uh, we also are concerned that, uh, uh, that the uh, participation of women in the workforce is not as uh, forcefully put forward here. Uh, certainly that is going to be a main driver and certainly uh, some of the largest employment gains will be women uh, entering into the workforce in more formal ways, as well as uh, having equity in pay, as well as in uh, standing. Um, as I mentioned, the financing of the education is an important aspect of that, uh, something that I think we all are uh, concerned about. Um, also, in terms of uh, this transition, it's not only just the technology uh, that the transition will have to be managed, but we have the process of climate change. How are we moving towards a more green economy? How are we going to a low carbon economy uh, in the future? Also demographics. Uh, in many developed countries, uh, there is a aging population where in a lot of developing countries you have a burgeoning youth population. How are we going to be able to provide good jobs for all the young people uh, around the world? Uh, for the ILO, 
social protection is a lifelong cycle. Um, the social protection floor, uh, ILO has a recommendation 202, and that will give you more prescriptive steps about where we believe uh, it should be going. Uh, and we've done the analysis, and it is affordable. I think a social protection floor that provides basic minimums for people in health and education uh, and in uh, financial support is affordable. Uh, most developing countries, it would range about 3 to 4 percent of the GDP. Um, the, the problem largely is political will. Are we going to be investing in the future? And, and it is an investment. I think some people talk about it as a cost. Um, just to talk to some specific points here, um, again, uh, I think the, there was uh, very interesting ideas that come out of the WDR. Uh, some of the prescriptions are a bit uh, different from our past uh, policy engagements. So I think you know, this is the, the purpose of uh, large organizations, is to put different views forward and find the, the medium in there. Um, but we do have to include the, the voice of the workers and look out for their protection, because as the ILO is a normative agency, we are a rights-based agency. Um, I believe that uh, in terms of the extension and the coverage of benefits, um, how is this going to reach the, uh, the, the majority of populations, particularly the working and middle class in developing countries uh, where revenue is constrained? Uh, if you have large informal economies, that revenue stream itself is just not there. You can't provide for that protection. Also, uh, the question of UBI, universal basic income, has come up. Um, the ILO is not necessarily in favor of that. I mean, of course, we have to look at all those policy prescriptions. Um, but how do you move from a full-fledged to, to a full-fledged UBI and uh, to sufficiently provide a high enough uh, income for people to prevent people from falling into poverty with a limited tax base? Um, there are some recommendations in the report about uh, social insurance, um, in some instances calling it an instrument of the past and associated with high levels of informality. Uh, we believe actually the opposite, that actually social insurance is a, a very important way to provide an economic stabilizer uh, to uh, many uh, individuals uh, when they lose their job or they have a disability. Um, and I think that's been a positive element in the analysis for the ILO. Um, uh, but I think, by and large, uh, all of these ideas on the table are what we're exploring for to improve the world of work. Um, we come at it from a point of view, as I said, with the tripartite, so the actors of the real economy talking about this. Um, we have to ensure uh, that the voices of those who are going to be affected by the policies have an opportunity to share in those decisions and also to share in the wealth that's being generated. Um, and I believe at the end of the day that we will uh, obviously come to a, uh, a fairly good uh, approach and look forward to working both with the IFIs and the World Bank and uh, other actors in this sphere. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, you touched upon uh, an issue which is demographics. By 2030, the UN predicts there's going to be more than 3 billion young people. And so I wanted to turn to Peter, who's been working on youth employment uh, issues at RTI on, on your views um, on the WDR and how it, it fits with your work. Thanks, Romina. I, mean, I thought you were teeing this up because you were talking about youth and you were going to say we have a youth here, and I know that's not true. Um, forever young, so. <laughs> forever young, that's right. Um, I want to want for, congratulate Fredrika and, and my neighbors and colleagues of the World Bank. I mean, I'm so glad to see that you used your flagship report this year to highlight what I know is a very, very important uh, topic. Um, I want to thank Romina for including me, and I've had the opportunity over the last year to engage in conversations as part of a task force on the future of work. Um, and so that's been very, uh, very interesting and helpful to me. Um, the other thing I just want to say was on the way over here in the metro this morning, I, mean, I want to thank all of you for coming in in the rain, voting early, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, when I was coming over in the metro, I don't know if any of you have seen this, I, I, I thought CSIS started a metro campaign for these kind of events because there was one of these big posters right across from where I was sitting. Have you seen this? Big letters that said, hang out before the robots take over. And I thought, well, maybe that's this event today. Or maybe it's a competing, a competing event. You may want to check it out. It's by some group called the Punchbowl Social. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You can Google that, and, and you can tell me how that goes. I don't think I'll be attending. Um, so um, again, I think this is an important issue. Um, unfortunately, I think it's an issue that our leaders are reluctant to talk about. It's kind of like climate change, right? I mean, there's, 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 there's all different perspectives and camps, and, and, and it's just sometimes easier to kick the can down the road. Um, 
Romina mentioned I worked at Cisco. We used to say that we operated in dog years. Um, I left Cisco about five years ago. I, I don't know what creature they're looking at in terms of the pace of technology and the pace of change uh, these days. Um, so I'm going to make two points. Um, my for, reacting to the report and reacting to this interest around this notion of the future of work that I've been living for a long time, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm, con I'm concerned, and I've shared this with, with, with Dan and Romina and others, um, that we really don't have a message. And we don't have a messenger. And I, I think this, um, I, I hope that this flurry of reports can help begin a dialogue, but I'm still very concerned that not enough attention is, is, is being placed on how do we frame the argument? How do we make the business case? And I think, you know, the, the, what I saw happen in 2016, we had one political leader parachute down into a community in West Virginia and say, you know, the coal industry is going away, your jobs are going to be changing, we've got to bring training into these communities so you have a future. And then the next political leader parachuted in and said, don't worry about it, I'm going to keep coal jobs for you. And we know how that turned out. You know, people basically don't like change. They don't want to talk about change, um, particularly when that has to do with their own livelihood and their own way of, of, of being. Um, when I worked at Cisco, our tagline, some of you may know it by heart, you know, was uh, changing the way we work, live, learn, and play. And that's what te technology's been doing for quite a while, along with globalization. So that's my first point, is we need to have the right messenger. I don't know any single person or any organization that seems to have the attention of, of uh, this, this, this global population. Second point. Um, so I'm an educator. That's, that's my training. At the heart of things, that's, that's who I am. And so let me speak to the section on lifelong learning. Um, I think the report lays out uh, the challenges quite well, um, but I'm afraid that all these reports, whether it's from McKinsey or, or the World Bank now, I don't think it, it, I think it misses uh, the opportunity to provide uh, some guidance, particularly for global education leaders. It's missing the how. Um, it, 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 and, and, and maybe that's the limitation of the report. Um, so in terms of that, I think as, as I read through that section and, 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 and a lot of the conversation around this, everybody turns to early childhood development. Let me, full disclosure, I like little kids, okay? I like little kids. Um, but, but I have to say, given you know, Kevin's point and, and, and Romina's afterwards, I mean, we're at an all-time high in, 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 in this population of youth, right? Those ages 14 to 24, I mean, 1.2 billion youth. And investments in early childhood education are important, but the return on those investments are going to take quite a while. And as a result, we've got this sort of population staring us in the face that basically is becoming a lost generation. And I thought Dan's article in The Hill recently on, on, on youth unemployment and global stability, I think, begins to look at security as an angle for trying to get this message across um, and to raise sort of the, the currency and raise the sense of urgency. Um, so I just think that that group um, needs attention now in the midst of this climate of looking at social policies, looking at uh, governments and in, in the way they govern, et cetera. Um, and I think right now is an opportunity to provide some guidance, particularly in the area of, of secondary, technical, and tertiary. And I know there is a section on tertiary, but maybe it was my read of it, but it, it, it left that secondary piece out. We've made huge investments globally on basic education, and we know there are more young people going through basic education. We know there's a heck of a lot that are dropping out. But we also know that the, the next move in some ways is around secondary. And right now, the only secondary track that exists is, is an affluent track, what I would call an affluent track. It's built on the British model, 
right? I hate to, uh, any British in the audience, I don't want to offend anyone. I try hard, but sometimes. It, it's an old model, it's outdated. And here we are, we're gonna, my fear is that as we move towards investments in technical education, uh, vocational education, or even secondary, we're gonna do it in the same way we've always been doing it, and that's not gonna keep pace with what's gonna happen, because these youth that we're talking about are gonna live longer, and they're gonna work a long time in the informal sector or the formal sector. I, I'm, I'm not gonna get touch that one. So in terms of the, the specifics, where I think there's some, you know, some need for detail and guidance for educational leaders, um, because I think they're thirsty. They know it, but they just don't know what to do. And sometimes I read reports and I'm not sure we know what to do. Um, so there's three things I think that are critically important. One is we've got to re-engineer curriculum and pedagogy. It's clear, right? I mean, first and foremost, I don't, I'm not, again, I like little kids. Here's my second full disclosure. I like soft skills. I believe in soft skills. But I got to tell you, if you don't have literacy and numeracy skills, at a, at a pertinent level in this environment, forget the, con the, the conversation about the future of work. So we need to look at ways that as young people enter these uh, secondary or tertiary institutions that we ensure that if they were, were, were uh, miss the opportunity to learn these skills in, in basic ed, we've got to bring them forth now. If you can't read a warning label on a bag of fertilizer, you're in trouble. If you can't read a simple uh, manual for, for a power tool, you're in trouble. But I also think that if we're going to look at literacy and numeracy rates, we need to teach them differently. We need to look, we know a lot more. We know about contextual learning. Um, we know that the adult mind learns different than, than, than the young mind. So I think that that's, that's a critical piece. Um, and the private sector, I know you told me you want to put the private sector in here. I think that's where the private sector can really help. It's not really seen traditionally as their role, but I've been involved in some amazing partnerships now with the private sector, with the public sector, uh, with government, with parents, with youth, to redesign classroom learning in ways that are more authentic and are more effective in reaching the skills that we know are so important. Second point is, Transformational, uh, transformation of teacher training. I mean, so if you're going to move on this curriculum, it's kind of like, you know, uh, I won't give a good example, of how much, but it, it, it's, it's the notion that, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you, if you're given the tools and there's no training around it, forget it. You know, it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So I think teacher training is, is a huge area that needs to be redefined in the climate of the future of work. And then the third one uh, is really around governance. Um, one of the biggest obstacles I can, that I've experienced in change in some of the countries that I've been working with is you can't make curricular reform because it's all top down. Um, even, if, even if the budget has de-evolved and is at the district or the county level in some of these countries, you're still beholden to the framework of, of the curriculum that's up there. Um, so I think uh, there needs to be a, a, a greater awareness of, of where they're blocking innovation and, and, and change um, because this is the critical pipeline that will not only um, you know, enter this sort of new world of work, but they're going to help shape it as well. So those are my two points that took a lot longer than, my, than, than two points should probably take. Thank you, Peter. I have a... Um you know, you, you touched upon the private sector, so, and, and skilling. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists what your views are, how the private sector can, can help in this lifelong learning journey. Um, what are your thoughts? What would you like to see from, from the private sector? And I know the ILO, you know, is tripartite, so, you know, companies are, are heavily invo involved in, in decisions and in programs, so, um, you know, Maybe we can start with Laura and, or, yeah. Well, of course, private sector is super important. They are the ones that are providing the jobs. The WDR actually makes a point of how much, how important are large firms in the different countries around the world. Um, and the, what happens in firms in terms of learning is super important. So any partnership that actually takes, um, like, especially for other learning, learning in the firms with, 
let's say, apprenticeship programs or any kind of arrangements where part of the learning is in the firm is super important because it's going to be really relevant for the needs of the firms. But more broadly also, like, uh, we have to push for the uh, much closer connection between employers and the education and training system. Uh, first of all, to inform the education and training systems about the skills needs. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there are different tools that have been applied in developed countries to gather information, like timely information about the needs of the employers. But there is so much to do in developing countries in that area. How to inform the education and training system, how to make it more relevant for the needs of the employers. So I see these two big areas to work on. Um, Kevin, what are your views? Thanks. Obviously, um, the private sector is going to benefit the most from a well-educated workforce. So I, I think that there has to be some serious consideration about how businesses can support that process. It can't just be the government's uh, cost alone. Um, but today, when we have changing natures of work, when people work for a very short period of time for a company, um, that, uh, that learning within the company uh, doesn't take place. So how do we look at that? So I, I think we need to uh, look at all our opportunities. I think uh, when we, for example, looking at the sustainable development goals, we look at financing. How are we going to achieve those goals? And one of the big things that came out of Audis is uh, how do we look at the tax regimes? Um, how are companies uh, paying their fair share to that as well too? Um, you know, the, the skills that are, we're looking for today are a mixture not only of the hard skills, but also the, the soft skills, the, uh, the communicative skills. So teamwork and problem solving and leadership and strategic approach. Um, that's not only just a hard skill, that, that requires a, a different side of learning as well too. Um, when, we, when we look at how that's faring for the workers, so if we're moving to the gig economy, and this was mentioned earlier, you know, it sounds great, you know, you're out of school, you want to work in a very flexible job. Um, you've front-loaded your career, you've piled up on debt, you have your skill sets, you go out and you're working uh, four, five, six, seven years, but you're then competing against everyone else for that job where you're only receiving a small amount of money uh, and obligated to pay your own taxes, whether you're in the Uber economy or the gig economy platform. Um, the freelancers union had said that 40% of gig workers today don't get paid for the work they have already done. So even workers who are highly skilled are having problems demanding the, the rightful pay that they have earned. The Taxi and Limousine Commission in New York had uh, recently done a study on uh, um, app drivers. And they found that uh, most Uber drivers earn below minimum wage and that almost 50% of them are on some form of public assistance. So now the costs have been shifted from the firm to the individual with these new models. Um, it reminded me of a statement that Ila Bhatt from Sewa made many years ago in the UN where she said the poor don't have jobs, they have economic opportunities, they string together to create a livelihood. Now, if we're heading down that path, uh, I, I think the future is going to be rather bleak. So, so I think it is a, uh, an opportunity for the, for the private sector, uh, the, the workers and employers, uh, because the private sector has two components, the governments themselves, um, academic institutions, the World Bank, other international organizations have to work together on finding a way forward to provide education, not only in a formal environment, but it could be in apprenticeships, it could be in non-formal, it could be in a, in, a, in a series of ways in order to to, to make that uh, work. Um, and then lastly, in terms of the education, I think the governance structure is very important as well too, as I think was mentioned very briefly. Um, right now, uh, are we fit for purpose? Are those, uh, are those institutions that are protecting both the workers and the employers, are they doing their measured best? Are we, uh, are we speaking at the, uh, at the same level? Sometimes we talk past each other. So I think there's a great deal of coordination that needs to be done in order to ensure that the future is bright for everyone and that those, um, and, and that the uh, the opportunities for young people to move and and uh, and earn the best that they can for the skills that they have is supported in a lifelong approach, not just in a front loading of that education. Thank you. Let me ask you about um, the unions. I, we don't have a, a union leader here, but the ILO is is tripartite. It's a very democratic institution. You have workers represented. You have the companies and governments. Um, what, what are you hearing there? What are their main concerns about the future of work? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? You know, you mentioned um, the, the Uber drivers and the, the unions in, in New York, but um, globally. 
not that I'm uh, qualified to speak on behalf of all of the, the workers, and, I, and I'm uh, happy to give some idea about it, but when we look at uh, workforces that have a high unionization rate, or even at times earlier on when there was a higher unionization rate, um, workers were paid better. Uh, the economy was thriving. You had uh, a stronger middle class. Uh, people were able to afford things that they're not able to do. We're seeing play out uh, in this country and many other countries, there's a nervousness, there's, a, there's an anxiety that I can no longer uh, provide for my family. I can't give my children a private education. So we found that when workers have a voice in uh, policies that affect them, they actually can have a, uh, a much better return on any investment. Uh, it's not just about higher wages, um, but it's about productivity, it's about profitability, it's about loyalty to the firm. I mean, anybody who works on the line building a tire knows a lot more about building a tire than the CEO or the CIO in that company. So you need that voice in there. So it, again, uh, we need to work together. I mean, we, we celebrate the business side. They're making those investments very important. Without those investments, there are no jobs. But without talented and industrious individuals working for a company, uh, you're not going to have a going concern. So the sustainability of businesses is the responsibility of both parties. So I think we're in this together, and we have to find a way to work together. Uh, but when you don't have a voice in the workplace, when you're disenfranchised, um, usually we find that people are become vulnerable, and by being vulnerable, they're paid lower than they should actually be on the overall. So Peter mentioned that there's no, um, you know, the message is not getting across, and uh, you know, ILO has this tripartite nature, and you've always been working on, on labor issues. What? What could these organizations do together um, on the future of work? I know you have different um, approaches and different views, but if you had to do you know, one thing um, in common, what, what would that commonality be? What area or uh, what policy prescription? So um, yeah, it's open uh, for you. Yeah, I have a suggestion. So Kevin just talked about the tripartite arrangements, and I don't disagree with what he was saying. We can debate further uh, the, the, whether, whether um, the, the impact of wage growth. But uh, I was telling you uh, and gave you numbers, so did Federica, about the persistence of informality worldwide. And I also uh, mentioned the uh, importance of recognizing that strengthening formality further disenfranchises informal sector workers. So what I want to propose is that we start thinking towards building not a tripartite world, but a pentapartite world, where in addition to employers, employees, and government, we would also invite to the table workers in non-standard employment contracts and those who are unemployed or not in the labor force. These are the groups that are not represented through a tripartite arrangement, and these are the groups that are in far worse situation than employers, employees, or the government. So the weakest do not have a voice. Uh, given that ILO has this long-standing experience with multi-partite arrangements, and given that we on the World Bank side feel very much that we represent the poorest, the most vulnerable, the most disenfranchised, we would like very much to work with the ILO to bring those in non-standard employment contracts and those who are unemployed to the tripartite table so we have a modern pentapartite arrangements that are consistent with the future of work. I was, I was going to add to that discussion on non-standard employment. That for example, in Argentina, where I'm from, recently they launched a labor union for uh, platform workers. It's called APP. Up. <laughs> that was a funny <laughs> word. <laughs> Always the Argentinians. But uh, this, uh, this is a, like, a group of people representing the Uber drivers and all of this. Uh, so this is interesting, because what's going to happen with labor unions in the future? Are we going to see more of these Argentine kind of things? Or are these going to? Well, we know that there are protests, but are they organized like a, like a labor union? That's a question. Um, in terms of what we can do, I think um, there is a space for all of the institutions in this conversation. And what I see in terms of the future of the future of work for our institutions is doing more country by country cases of what it means for this specific country in terms of what's uh, what's happening now, what has been uh, going on in the in the recent past, and 
trying to foresee what's going to happen in the future, and trying to elaborate a set of policy that is specific for that specific country. And for that, because there is so much work to do, I think there is space for collaboration and coordination. If we are going to look at Mexico specifically, well, let's talk and see what they are going to do that is going to be productive and that's going to have a policy prescription for Mexico specifically and how we can collaborate on that. Um, and for that, I think uh, the WDR is an important space with the dissemination that's happening now uh, to talk with the specific countries to set up an agenda and we are doing the same thing from the IDB, so the coordination would be super good because we need to act as soon as possible in the specific policies for the specific countries. So let me throw something out a little controversial, uh, if I haven't already. I mean, so, so first of all, I think that we're in an era where there's a lot more attention around collective impact. And so I think when you see collaboration happening uh, among the various stakeholders, I think it, it, there's, some, there's some pockets. There's some regional activities that are very powerful. There's, um, there's, there's certainly some efforts at the country level. But bringing stakeholders together, as you know, is, not easy. I mean, it, you know, it's what was once termed to me, uh, described to me as, as unnatural acts among uh, consenting adults. Um, I, I, so, I, I, you know, that, that's the first challenge. In terms of these organizations, uh, one is we've got too many reports. Why does every one of these big organizations do a separate report? And, you know, I, I don't know what that rationale is yet. I also have been working with NGOs that are all working on various projects. They're very, this is a very competitive environment. There is very little collaboration, little sharing of knowledge, to be honest. Um, and that's not what the world is. I mean, even the corporate sector is working with other corporations on external R&D. So all the research and development is not happening internally because we know the best, I, the best ideas are not among one or two people within a single company. It's when you put heads together, different perspectives, um, and you, you really move that. Uh, that's where the ideas, the innovations come from. And all the, all the efforts around trying to capture innovation after uh, kind of the internet launch, fascinating books to read because they're all looking at the same question and that's kind of been the conclusion. And so I think there are clearly um, co collaborative efforts that happen among some of these lo very large global institutions. But new models need to emerge if we're going to really make a difference, if we're really going to look for innovations. That's just my, my, my hope, uh, my, my thought. I don't know if it's ever, ever doable. I like the proliferation of, of reports about the future of work. I actually think that this is the first wave of like advocacy and trying to get the attention on the topic. So the many like reports that you see, many of them are like have similar points of view, but I think it's the first wave and we are in, at the moment of we're trying to get the attention and now the, in the second wave is where we really have to pay attention to collaboration and, and like discussion to see what we can do, uh, if it, this is something that specific countries can do or they, they are copying models from developed countries. But I, I welcome like in the first wave of the research to have many institutions competing, let's say, for the attention. But for me, it was a good first wave. And each could I jump in? Could yeah. I jump in? It, it's just a very quick comment to say, and yes, you are being provocative, eh? Uh, you know, that you need these voices and the way big institutions actually communicate and share knowledge is through the reports. So I, I, I do encourage that to happen. Nothing substitutes for collaboration and, and, and resolving the problem on the ground. But in order to develop the policies, you have to do the research, you have to do the statistical analysis, you actually have to have the evidence to show that this policy is going to work. And I think through reports, we're change, exchanging ideas, finding the right mix of that, and then moving forward. But traditionally, that's the way in which big institutions do share our knowledge base. Plus, each institution, you know, has an angle. So, um, you know, they highlight a value add. Um, so, if any of you have weekend, don't, you don't have weekend plans. I really re recommend that you read, you know, the WDR. We at CSIS have also launched um, 
two reports on uh, the future of work. We called it differently. We called it the future of global stability because, as Peter mentioned, uh, we want to highlight that you know the the main issue is employment and of course um, you know the the demographics and technological changes that are happening. So um, again, weekend reads and. Uh, ILO has a lot of information, a lot of good work on the future of work and the IDB. So um, we have, sorry, we have just five minutes left and I had like other questions for the panelists, but maybe I'll, um, I'll close with some, I mean, I don't know if any uh, of, the, of the public wants to raise some questions for Federica or for any of the panelists. Oh, okay. We have, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, but um, maybe we'll take just two questions and then I'm happy to, you know, you can chat afterwards if, um, if they want to, if, if the panelists want to, uh, can stay. Uh, so I'll take a question here from this lady and you had a question, a gentleman. So a lady and a gentleman here and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Sure. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation. Sure. Is this on? Okay. Yeah, my name is Sherry Youssef, and I'm the director of work at FHI 360. Thank you for a great panel, great report. Um, I just got back from Jordan about 10 days ago on a very kind of intimate discussion with the Minister of Labor. Of course, informality came up. It's a huge issue, and he was as stubborn as can be that his job is to formalize him and every other Minister of Labor in that part of the world and many others. And I'm wondering... I hear you, Peter, in terms of a messenger, and I'm wondering why, with a report like this, won't this start to influence World Bank lending, IMF lending, to force governments to really reconsider and revisit what their landscape looks like? Because this insistence on formalizing, my job is to formalize, is really, as you rightly noted, pushing in the wrong direction. There is no other option for youth and many other unemployed other than to be infor informally engaged. So I'm wondering if there is any conversation about that in any of your institutions. And I feel that that's a messenger that carries weight and they say countries do and it might be an effective platform. My other quick point is thank you for addressing the um, adolescent stage of life. I think that I also found the report a little um, lacking in addressing the critical neurological kind of cognitive development that happens in that adolescent to adulthood stage, which is the cohort we're talking about. I think it's proven now neurologically, it's even more important than those first three stages of life in terms of rewiring the brain and kind of getting that workforce out there. And I think that we really need to focus on that adolescent to adulthood transition more than the early childhood. So. Okay, another question and yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Mace van der Werf. I study right at the corner at Science Johns Hopkins. Um, Mr. Madame Serriola, but the panelists as well seem very optimistic and confident that the technical innovation uh, and the loss of jobs connected to that will be outstripped by new jobs created by technological innovation. And I know that that has been the case in the past and all the chimney sweeps all found new work as programmers. But why do we feel so confident that that will remain to be the case? Is there any evidence that we do not have to worry about large unemployment following from that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the I, I, you know, the, when, I, when I think about change, I think about horses. I mean, you know, so from, from the earliest time, the only way you had transportation was horses, donkeys, camels, right? That's how people moved around. Um, and with the invention of the car, with the automobile, I mean, it was 40 years before that, in, in, in such a short period of time, that technology just took over. And I always think about folks that kind of lived on, in, in, in that transect, and, and, and what did they think, right? And I think that's what we're in the midst of again. I think we're in the midst of, of a major change it's, it's, that, that folks just aren't really paying attention to. And that's why my point around reports and, message and, and messenger is I'm, I'm concerned. We don't know what the future is, right? We don't know. Um, we, can, we can systematically or, you know, look at it. Um, but I think when we look at the history, I think we, we, we know that there are big disruptions and there's smaller disruptions. And I think that some of this is really coming together. And it's, it's also transecting sort of our social and moral fabrics uh, globally and within countries. And that's a huge one to shift, you know? Uh, how do you shift that minister in Jordan to really think about sort of the 
sort of the moral and social aspects of all of this and understanding, really asking questions about their, their policies and procedures. I, I think uh, the fear of roads taking over and in terms of the potential destruction of jobs uh, was like very high in the, in, like, the talks because the, there was a paper by uh, Oxford University about uh, the US, uh, the impact of technology on jobs was like 47% of jobs were gonna be destroyed in around 20 years. But then uh, the studies uh, went to another type of research looking at tasks, right? Uh, what you do every day, and then seven, only 7% 7 of, let's say, full jobs were gonna be destroyed and not the 47% that was initially like estimated. But what uh, it, this uh, second wave of studies shows is that uh, many, like, in our jobs, many of the tasks are gonna change. So what you do every day, part of it is gonna be replaced by technology, let's call it robots or something else, and you're gonna have to change and modify what you do every day to do different things. So I think the changing, the transformation of the way we work is what is gonna be most like impactful and not so much the huge technological unemployment. Like many, many people, like half of us will be out of work directly. It's gonna be more like, how our day-to-day -day is going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. On a brief thing uh, on Jordan, which is that you touched upon something very important, which is the dialogue on the issues of how to deal with informality is a difficult one because of the mandate of the ministers or the way they perceive it. But in the case, concrete case of Jordan, actually we are trying to influence the agenda. We have a jobs development policy operation in preparation, which tries to influence the labor regulations towards making them more growth friendly. And in that context, that makes it also uh, the formal sector more open to um, having access of workers currently in the informal sector. So, so that dialogue is going on, but I agree with you that this is a, this is a difficult one for, a, for many reasons uh, which, you, which you listed. Sorry to, to jump in there. Um, look, work has always been changing, whether it is the paddle to the sail or the, uh, the plow to the, the oxen driven or the elevator, the light bulb, the computer, uh, the steel and glass. I mean, the world of the work has always been changing. Right now, it's a digital technology. Um, it's not to be, uh, you know, to uh, just be relaxed and say everything is going to work out. I mean, it, it depends on the investments we make in the decisions and the policies that are in place. So it's not going to happen of its own volition, but I do think that there are enough people focused on this that the world of work can be beneficial. Higher level, you know, technology requires higher level skills. Higher level skills will give a higher level pay. That doesn't happen on its own, and that gets me to this issue of non-standard forms of employment. I don't necessarily agree that you know, informality is okay. I think back in the 1950s and 60s when this f term first came out, some people thought that that was a good response to the lack of the uh, formal uh, economy to absorb all the workers. I don't think that that happened magically. But if you don't have protection, and if you could be in a non-standard form of employment, but as long as there are protections for that individual worker, that's great. But that doesn't happen on its own, just like the policies we develop. So there has to be someone to provide that voice, to contextualize it. The World Bank representative here mentioned about speaking for the poor. Well, that's really important because if the voice, uh, the poor is not heard, then their concerns are not heard, that the, 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 the troubles that they face are not going to rise at a level of policy. So I, I do think that there has to be some engagement. It does, doesn't happen on its own. So uh, we're confident, but you know, let's, uh, let's work to hard towards that. A few, few remarks. Um, I would like to address two questions. One is about the optimism and then the trade-off between early childhood and the, you know, addressing the problems of the current uh, labor force. I mean, on the optimism, it is true we don't know about the future. And this is a strong message that we put in the report. We, we need to live with uncertainty. But when you look at the numbers, uh, uh, you know, for the, let's say, the past 30 years and today, so Take Europe, right? It is, a con it is a region which is heavily manufacturing based. And it's a region where, you know, also the artificial intelligence technology heavily landed. But then when you look how many jobs were destroyed, how many jobs were created on average, you see that more jobs were created by that technology, about 42 million jobs compared to the number of jobs destroyed. So if we want to just base our you know, feeling on facts, that's an important fact. 
automation brought more jobs in that region. But even when you look at this, you know, think about the iPhones, right? The iPhones are creating so many jobs because all, you know, the services that are linked to that, the app developer job, it's something that came to the market just, you know, 20 years ago. There are millions of app developers in India. It's a new job that this little device brought to the market. How much that is facilitating our life, right? We came here, it was raining, and mm -hmm. imagine if we had to look for a taxi, right? We call Uber, right? So, so overall, it is true that technology is bringing disruption, and it's not easy. That's why we, we have this big call for governments. I agree on the active labor market policies. There are many things that we haven't really probably managed successfully. But overall, looking at present and past, looking at numbers, looking at facts, the benefits um, are you know, more, re more, let's say, than, than the damages that the technology uh, brings. But I also just, uh, if I have one mm -hmm. minute, on the early childhood development versus you know, literacy and numeracy, we, we could not agree more on that. In fact, you know, and, and that addressed a little bit your point about how you change the mindset of policymakers, precisely to build on the World Development Report that was done last year, it was fully focused on education, we decided to develop this human capital index that builds that on that methodology that shows how many few people you know, have literacy and numeracy skills, mm. right? especially in developing countries. But the way we did it, we tried to change the incentives of policymakers. And how you change the incentives of policymakers, you need to you know, understand what, what would do well for them right? when, when they implement a policy that oftentimes are, are, are painful. So the way we did it, we translated human capital into productivity and to GDP. So, so what that index tells you now is that if, you know, based on the health and education today, you know, there's a, a child born today, and, and, you know, the index is for country X 0 0.60, it means that if health, primary and secondary education don't change, that person will, have, will be only 60% as productive as she could be if she enjoy full health and education. Right. So it is a long process, but, but that's something that we try to do to, to address precisely the, the incentive and how to manage the, the, the policy dialogue and to re-emphasize the importance of those basically, you know, skills that in primary and secondary school. But in a way, if we only now focus on addressing the issues of the, of the youth today and we disregard the early childhood development, that we always get in this vicious cycle, right? It, it is a trade-off, uh, but I, I do think that in, in addressing the problems of, of all these young people that enter the labor market today, that they don't have the right skills, we know there are skin mismatch, there are not private sector jobs. You, you mentioned Jordan. In the MENA region is a classic example of a highly educated workforce that has no jobs, right? And the few jobs are there that they, they can be filled because there is a skill mismatch. So, you know, big, big issue that are unresolved. But we still, we need to think about how to invest better in the future. And it is painful um, because, as I say, it's a trade-off. Governments only have limited resources. Oftentimes they need to allocate, so there are competing goals. But, you know, if we really want to change things in a way that is more radical in the future, I think early childhood development cannot be disregarded. Okay, thank you so much for coming and thank you Federica and to all the panelists for that interesting discussion and uh, you all have weekend reading to do, so. Okay. <laughs>